It's okay. So let's start. So welcome to the peace seminar. Today we, we have Tinila Kura, who is going to talk about the maximal intrinsic randomness of a quantum state. She's currently a second year PhD student at IFO, working clearly in the quantum theory group of Antonio Athim. And um, previously she studied at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo and also at the University College in Dublin. Um, she is mainly interested in the topics of non-locality and quantum randomness. So now you can share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Paula. I'll just look for my slides. To check that's visible for everybody. Yeah, yeah, we see it perfectly. Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much. So, uh, as Paula said, uh, my PhD student at ICFO in the Quantum Information Theory Group. Uh, for this reason, I want to start with a bit of a disclaimer. So, my research is mostly in the quantum information theory, a somewhat more foundational side. So, I know this is the uh, network for quantum technology. So, I've tried throughout this to to put, bring in applications and uh, uh, more practical motivations for the research we do as far as I can. So see how we go with this. Um, and so my goal for, for the seminar is to answer these four questions. So I mentioned that, um, it's the maximal intrinsic randomness of a quantum state is the title. So we want to know what is intrinsic about quantum randomness? What do I mean by intrinsic randomness? How does it compare to our classical idea of randomness? Uh, and then once we've defined that, how do we quantify intrinsic randomness concretely? Uh, and then given that you have uh, a certain set of quantum resources, how can you extract the maximal intrinsic randomness from this and what protocol or measurements should you use? And most importantly, why should we care about this? So on the more foundational side, uh, why do we care about randomness? What does it mean? And on the more practical side, how can we use it? Uh, and so most of what I'll talk about is based on this preprint that my collaborators and I put up in the archive at the end of uh, July. And that's just a little, uh, little slideshow of some of my collaborators. So Chu Yang Meng was the, is the first author and is based in Singapore. And then the rest of us are spread throughout uh, ICFO, Singapore and University of York in the UK also. And so I do discuss mostly the results of this uh, this manuscript. I also try and give a bit of context as to uh, the broader field where these results fit into. Uh, okay, so I'll start with a very broad definition. So. Uh, yeah, what, what is randomness? So I've attached a dictionary definition here, which kind of gives our, our usual everyday idea of something is random if it happens uh, according to some probability that isn't zero and it's not one. Um, but of course, in science, we will have a more, a more concrete uh, description of this. But uh, it's something that's important for performing simulations. Uh, for example, Monte Carlo simulation involves random, random sampling. And also for some algorithms, uh, it is more efficient to use algorithms for some cases that are non-deterministic versus deterministic ones. And then, of course, it's very important for cryptography. In fact, it's a, it's a, a main assumption in uh, cryptographic protocols that uh, parties would have access to some randomness. And so I've, I've shared here two of the more traditional ideas of how one would generate randomness uh, oneself. So you could have a coin or you could have a dice and our idea of generating a, a bit string that's random would be just to flip a coin a certain number of times, record the outcome each time. And that is your your very, uh, very basic random number generator. Uh, and two things that you want usually in your randomness is for it to be uh, happen according to a, uni uh, a uniform probability distribution. So if it's with zeros and ones, you'd want in each given uh, round to have a 50-50 probability of getting zero or one uh, typically. And also a very important feature is the privacy of the randomness. And this is a bit more subtle and it's not so easy to tell looking at the, the string of uh, bits that you have, if it's private or not. Um, and so for the case of simulations and algorithms, when we use randomness, we don't typically care uh, if someone else has access uh, to to our um, bit string or not, but in the case of crypto cryptography, it is uh, very important that this randomness is private 
by private would mean it can't be accessed or hacked by any eavesdroppers. Um, and there's a classical and quantum divide when it comes to randomness in terms of its privacy, because when we say we don't want any eavesdroppers to access the privacy or access the randomness, um, we have to consider what constraints we have on these eavesdroppers. So uh, in the quantum case, if you have, for example, a pure state like the one that's uh, written here, it's a superposition of, um, in the computational basis given by the coefficients alpha and beta. So if I were to, if I had access to the state and I measured it in the computational basis, um, then as long as alpha and beta aren't, uh, neither of them is zero, then I won't know uh, in advance uh, with full probability which uh, outcome I'll get. I only know according to the probability of the, the coefficient squared, which one. And furthermore, not only do I not know, but no one in the universe, even with infinite knowledge of everything that's happened up until that point, couldn't know uh, what the outcome would be. So this is what we say when we talk about intrinsic randomness, that uh, there's no possible eavesdropper that could access it. Um, and this is has no uh, classical equivalent to this kind of randomness because classical theory is deterministic. So even in the pictures that I showed of the dice and the, uh, the toying costs, in principle, um, when I toss a coin, this is a classical object, it's described by classical rules. So we would imagine that if you really had perfect knowledge about how exactly I flipped the coin, uh, the air pressure, the specifications of that coin, in theory, we should be able to um, tell which way it would land. Of course, in practice, um, we can't measure everything infinitely well. There's a certain number of decimal points and macroscopic um, processes are, are quite complicated. But this kind of randomness that we get from classical physical processes is fundamentally very different to the quantum case, uh, where no, um, no possible observer could access it. Uh, and so this kind of intrinsic randomness can and has been harnessed for random number generators uh, in the quantum case. And so I've just attached a photo of many different types of random number generators, just first of all, to show this is very active uh, field. And also to show that there's many, not all random number generators are made equal. So if you see the first splitting within this flow chart is between pseudo random number generators and true random number generators. So in the, the pseudo case, uh, this is entirely classical and it's where you would use a classical algorithm to create a random seed, which could be just a number or a vector. And then from this, you would uh, get a distribution um, of numbers. And how private this randomness is depends on how much computational power you think your eavesdropper should have. Um, so in some cases, this might be fine, but it is quite a difference to the, class to the quantum case where we want to consider the maximally powerful eavesdropper. On the other side, we have the true random number generators, and this is based on physical processes. Um, so in the classical case, it might be using noise from uh, electricity or thermal processes, uh, using that for your randomness, but the problem is it's hard to verify then uh, how private that is because it's not a process in your control exactly. But then in the quantum case, uh, which is the one, of course, I'll be focusing on, within this, there are some subtypes too. There's the case where you trust your devices that you're working with. Um, so you trust the state that you have, you trust the measurement that you have, you know how they're characterized. And this is the case that the results that I'll be sharing um, fit into. And then there are also um, other cases where you don't trust your devices at all, which is the device independent case, or where you trust some of them, but not all of them. It's a semi-device independent case. And in these cases, you'll be using non-locality um, to certify your results. So just to go back then to, yeah, intrinsic randomness and what do I mean? So in the previous example that I gave, we had a pure state. Um, and if we have a perfectly pure state, for example, I had that qubit, I could measure in a basis that will give me 50% of the time one outcome and 50% of the time the other one. So that's a uniform distribution and it is um, perfectly private randomness. So basically we could stop there. That's ideal, that's what I want. But in real life, it is more likely that we will have uh, a mixed state because real systems are affected by noise, imperfections. So that's the consideration of, of the work uh, that I've done here, is that when you have a, a mixed state, um, how does this uh, these imperfections affect the randomness that can be extracted from it? Uh, and so when we have a mixed state in quantum theory, it can mathematically be represented as a probabilistic combination of other states according to some probability distribution. So uh, assuming that I have a state row, uh, and I trust that I know what that row is, 
but I don't know. I can perform um, many rounds of some protocol and I know on average um, what my state is, but maybe in each individual round, I don't know what it is. I just know what average is out to row. So this is what we call having a trusted state, but it's from an untrusted source um, because I don't know in each round. And in the case where I really don't trust the source, I don't trust the person I bought it from, um, I might imagine that this the actual um, state that I receive in each round, it isn't known by me, but it might be known by an adversary or an eavesdropper. So in the example that I've given here, we have a mixed state row, and all I see is, is row, and that's as far as I know, that's what I get each time. But actually, I might be getting uh, one of these pure states, um, psi minus or psi plus each time, and there could be an eavesdropper with access to this information. And the problem here is if I'm using my state to generate randomness by performing a measurement and then recording the measurement outcome to create my uh, random string, the problem is that the eavesdropper will have better knowledge than I do about um, what the measurement outcomes will be. Um, so we want to know then how can we minimize this uh, probability that the eavesdropper could um, access these random numbers. So it's helpful uh, in this case to, to characterize the, the eavesdropper as a person. So this is Eve. And we assume Eve has the maximum uh, powers she could have as a quantum eavesdropper. So in practice, then when I have um, performing different rounds of my protocol, I assume Eve knows the real state every single time, whereas I only know the average state row. Um, and I assume that the decomposition uh, into states according to some probability is the best one for Eve to guess my outcomes. So a quantum, a mixed quantum state can be decomposed into infinitely many decompositions. So I assume that it's the best one for her. And since I've said that Eve knows the real state in every round, mathematically it's equivalent to say that Eve has a purification uh, of the state row, which means she just um, has the rest of the state, essentially, she has a, a local state that's entangled with row, and she performs measurements on her own local state. Uh, and from that, then she'll know what state uh, is being sent. And it might seem that that's overcomplicating things to, to bring that into it, but actually it turns out that this makes uh, matters a bit easier because then there's a lot of, uh, a lot of literature about uh, quantum steering that we can use then. So, and this is our full picture. So just like we've introduced the character Eve, I introduced the character Alice. So Alice is the one who is generating randomness uh, for herself. She's the one that has the state row. And so, as I've just said, it's um, we can consider that Eve is steering a set of states um, to Alice. So we say she steers the ensemble, which is the, the combination of the probability distribution and the, the states that are sent. She steers this ensemble to Alice. Uh, Alice overall receives the state row and Alice will measure uh, in this basis mi. But because these two parties aren't signaling to each other, um, in this case when we said that Eve steers uh, Alice's states, we're considering that Eve measures her states first and then Alice receives um, this ensemble of states. But since they're not signaling, it doesn't really um, matter that much who signals first uh, or who signals second because they're never going to be able to communicate this to each other. So we could equivalently say that Alice measures her state first. So she has a state row uh, and she measures it. And Eve is the one that actually receives an ensemble of states uh, given uh, here as just um, the post-measurement states. Uh, and in this case, Eve is the one who's performing state discrimination to try and tell uh, what state she now has and infer from that what state Alice measured. So these, these cases are completely equivalent. Um, and in some cases, it's easier to think of one than the other. So in both cases, they're doing um, the same protocol, the same measurements. It's just how we're interpreting it. Uh, and it's nice because like steering, there's a wealth of uh, literature on um, quantum state uh, discrimination that we can use. So um, this is how we quantify randomness at first. So we imagine that Alice is performing a projective measurement. Uh, and I'll go back later to why we make this restriction to not just completely general measurements, but projective. Um, so we're considering the probability that Eve guesses average's outcome of her measurement correctly. Uh, and so this is given by a semi-definite programming problem or an SDP. And if you're not so familiar with these, uh, it's a type of optimization problem where the things that's being optimized is some trace over positive matrices and all of the constraints on the optimization are either positive, semi-definite, so things greater than or equal to zero or um, linear constraints. 
And so uh, the reason we get this big yes is that we're considering uh, all the different um, states that Alice could receive according to a probability PI. And then the probability that uh, Eve measures or Eve guesses the correct outcome is given then by the Born rule. Uh, and then we sum that over all the different states you could get. And then we're maximizing over all the possible ensembles that Eve could send. So that's how we come up with this uh, this expression. And then so this semi-definite programming problems have an advantage that um, they're very easy to calculate computationally. So given rho and given m, which is Alice's measurement, I can easily uh, find the guessing probability for Alice. Um, but the thing is, I don't just want to input m myself. I want to find what measurement Alice should make that would minimize Eve's guessing probability. So these two are working against each other. Alice is trying to minimize the guessing probability, or p guess, which I'll call it, and Eve is trying to maximize it. Um, so we end up with this final expression uh, for p guess with a star, which is what we call the optimal uh, p guess for this particular state row. And it's a minimization over all of Alice's measurements. And the difficult part here is while p guess for a fixed m was a semi definite programming problem, this one with the minimization over measurements isn't, and that's because we've made this restriction on projective measurements, and that's no longer a, 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 an STP restriction. It's not linear, it's not uh, positive semi-definite. So we have to use more analytical work uh, to go from there. And so I'll just explain now why we restrict to projective measurements in the first place. So if we wanted to perform a non-projective measurement, a more general POVM, as we could call it, uh, we would need either access to an additional quantum resource beyond just rho, or an additional source of randomness. And so in the first case with the, the quantum resource, uh, we would have rho and we have the other quantum state and we perform a global projective measurement and then um, then looking locally then at rho itself, it's not a projective measurement that's uh, happened on it when we uh, reduce it down. But we want to consider just what happens when we have rho itself and no other uh, no other um, state because we don't want to consider the randomness coming from the other uh, the other resource. And on the other side, if you had another source of randomness, you could take, for example, this first um, measurement that I've written here, where it's just uh, um, a projector onto zero, projector onto one. Um, you could perform this just on row with no auxiliary state, but then you would use your source of randomness to split one of the outcomes, for example, a zero one, into two different ones, just arbitrarily re-relabeling them. But the problem with this is in our framework, the only source of randomness you can trust would become from a, a pure state. So in this case as well, you are in fact using a, an extra quantum state. So we want to consider the case where you only have rho and in this case, the only thing you can do with it is a projective measurement. And so having made this restriction to projective measurements, uh, we show in our work that coarse grain in the measurement uh, won't increase the randomness. So this is where you have, uh, you could perform the um, the first measurement there, which is uh, rank one, and you would just group some of the measurement the measurement outcomes together. Um, so we showed this this will never help Alice; it won't increase the randomness. So she may as well, if she's doing projective measurements, perform a rank one projective measurement, uh, which is just uh, gives you a pure state in the end. And this is very useful because this means instead of thinking of general measurements, we're now just thinking of an orthonormal basis. So for some calculations, this is very helpful. Um, and now I've mentioned the p-guess, but if you want to talk more generally about uh, how to quantify randomness, there are actually many ways to do this. So I've just listed three randomness quantifiers here. Um, so the first here is the conditional min entropy. It's um, completely related to uh, the p-guess. And so this um, min conditional min entropy and the conditional max entropy, they're both introduced together um, in the context of quantum key distribution, but they weren't so, didn't have such an intuitive um, intuitive interpretation until later on when an interpretation was uh, discovered for them. So in the case of the max entropy, it's related to um, this, well, the symbol that I've written is PSEC. It is, um, it's a quantifier of how secret um, Alice's outcomes are. And this is found by uh, comparing how the post-measurement state between Alice and Eve, how far away is that from just being a completely separable state uh, where Eve could just know nothing about it. Um, so these are two uh, two very different ways of measuring uh, randomness. And then in the middle here, we have the conditional von Neumann entropy. And this um, <clears throat> comes from the, the von Neumann entropy, which has many uses in quantum information theory. It's even used in um, quantifying entanglement. 
Um, but in this case, um, the condition of one and entropy between the parties would quantify how much quantum inf quantum communication Eve would need um, to get the full state um, post measurement between her and Alice. So to recreate the entire uh, state, the parts that she's missing from what Alice's measurement outcomes are. So it's not quite as clear um, interpretation as, as the H-min. Um, and in all of these cases, it's the conditional entropy, not just the entropy, because we're conditioning on the knowledge Eve already has. We want to know, um, given that Eve has uh, this extra knowledge, what randomness do we have then in that case? And this um, set of inequalities applies. H-min is always less than H, always less than H-max. So um, in this project, we only considered um, H-min and H, um, and mostly H-min because of how uh, intuitive the interpretation was with the guessing probability. And so this is just a kind of summary of the results um, that we got. So we've got um, an analytic expression for the optimal uh, H-min, conditional min entropy for given a state row. And it's given by this expression. <clears throat> and from this, you could plug in directly to find oh, what the guessing probability would be in this case. Um, and so we can see looking at this, it depends only on the dimension and just the, the state itself, actually the square root of the state. Um, so, of course, if you increase the dimension of the projective measurement you're making, um, your probability, uh, guessing probability will be less because there's just more outcomes to choose from for you. And also when we have the trace of the square root of rho, um, this will reach its minimum value uh, if rho is pure. In this case, um, guessing probability, as we expect, is 1 over d. And uh, Eve is just guessing completely randomly according to the distribution. Uh, but in the case where rho is maximally mixed, we find that this gives us, this squared expression gives us d, and the whole thing is just the guessing probability of 1. So Alice actually produces no randomness in this case. Um, and so as well as finding this expression for the, <clears throat> the optimal uh, conditional min entropy, we also find a uh, necessary and sufficient condition for the measurement that Alice should choose um, to extract this randomness. And that's given here in the form, uh, yeah, again, it relies on the square root of rho. And move on now to the conditional von Neumann entropy, uh, somewhat similar set of results. So again, it's an expression characterized by the dimension and just uh, the properties of rho. And in this case, I've given the full expression for what um, S here is the von Neumann entropy. And uh, again, it reaches maximum value when, um, when the, the state is pure. And in this case, um, it's log 2d, which is the same as the H-min. So they actually meet at this point when you have a pure state. Uh, and again, we find a necessary sufficient condition uh, to, mac to to reach this optimal um, optimal value. And it's very similar to the previous one, but here now uh, the square root of rho is replaced with rho itself. And actually this condition for the measurement is a lot more intuitive because uh, the left-hand side uh, of this expression is just the probability that uh, when Eve performs her measurement on a row, that she'll get the outcome I. So we find that the probability of all the outcomes should be um, the same, which is the other condition that we actually want for randomness, normally the uniform probability distribution. So um, it's, it's nice to find out that when we're maximizing uh, this condition of one of an entropy, we're also uh, for free um, fulfilling the condition that our probability distribution is uniform. Uh, and so, we have two different conditions then um, for yeah, necessary and sufficient conditions uh, from, for reaching the optimal H and the optimal H. And we find that these uh, conditions are both satisfied always if we choose a measurement uh, that's in a basis that's unbiased to the diagonal basis of rho. So the diagonal basis is just the basis in which we can re represent rho only along the diagonal in terms of its eigenvalues. Um, so in the case I've pictured here, it's just um, it's the computational basis. And so an example of a basis unbiased uh, to this computational basis would be any any basis that lies in the horizontal um, circle there. Uh, and and the state um, the definition of what it is to be two bases to be unbiased is that if you take any vector from one of the bases, any vector from the other, and find the square and a product of them, that this should be equal, should be one over d for any choice. <clears throat> and so just putting all these results together then um, in the form of a very basic uh, quantum random number generator um, that Alice is doing with just her qubit system. 
So imagine she has this qubit system that's diagonal in the computational basis. And uh, because of this, it's parameterized only by this one uh, real parameter, eta. Uh, and when eta is one, she has a pure state. When eta is half, she has the maximally mixed state. And so she should make optimally uh, an unbiased measurement um, so she could choose any any measurement in that uh, horizontal circle. So she may as well choose plus and minus. Um, and so this is a list of the uh, two types of randomness that she will achieve and the guessing probability. And when you look at these expressions, um, you'll, you'll find that it's always, uh, it increases the randomness as it goes, as uh, it increases towards uh, rho being a pure state. And the randomness decreases as it goes down towards uh, rho being maximally mixed. And so... In practice, what Alice would do, she would measure uh, row, uh, her state n times, write down the outcome each time, and she has uh, a bit string then of um, of length n, and it forms a uniform distribution because she chose a mutually unbiased basis to measure in. And, and so, given that, I'm just going to give some a bit more detail about um, technically how these bounds were derived um, for for both types of randomness. Uh, and so this was based on existing results. It was known that the guessing probability, given the, the state in the measurement, had this form uh, as a maximization of um, over the fidelity between um, the state itself and some other state that's diagonal in the measurement basis. Uh, and this is the expression for fidelity just below. And so this might seem a bit counterproductive. We're just replacing the maximization we had with a different one. But in this case, the maximization is over states and not just over ensembles of states so it's a little bit easier um and so because we can exploit the fact then that uh the maximally mixed state is diagonal in every basis because it's just proportional to the identity um so no matter what measurement we have we can always just plug in the maximally uh, mixed state there to find a lower bound for the guessing probability and that's what we do and we find our lower bound and then Having found this lower bound, we then have to show that it's actually achievable because maybe it's it's not um, it's not possible for Alice to actually manage this. And um, so that was our next step. And to do this, we exploit then uh, the tools that semi-definite programming gives to us. Uh, so this is back to the expression for p guess that we had. Um, and because it's a semi-definite programming, we call it the primal problem. Uh, and that's because for any problem in semi-definite programming, we have a dual problem. So when the primal is a maximization over something, the dual will be a minimization over something. And um, so in this case, we have a minimization, but we still we see that it still depends on the same uh, inputs. So still, we have the measurement showing up there and we have the state showing up there. And in almost all cases, the primal problem uh, when you do that maximization and the dual problem when you do the minimization will give you the same value. You have to check some conditions for that to work. It's called Slater's condition, but most cases it's true and it's tr true in our case. So that means we can... Instead of thinking about the, the maximization problem, uh, think of the dual problem instead. And the best thing is because it's a minimization problem, uh, it can help us to find an upper bound uh, on the guessing probability. So we find then that when we choose measurements that satisfy that square root condition that we had earlier, <clears throat> we can input uh, a matrix X into our, our dual problem um, that's uh, given there, and that will give us a lower bound and then when the measurement um, condition is satisfied, uh, all the conditions for X are satisfied too. It has to be greater than or equal to each of the measurement um, elements. And so this, by plugging this in, we get then a lower bound for the guessing probability. So now we have an upper bound for the guessing probability and a lower bound, and they're exactly equal. So we find that, well, this is the optimal value and it can be achieved using these measurements. <clears throat> And going back then to that um, that condition, necessary and sufficient condition that we found uh, for the measurement with the square root, this gave us an unexpected um, connection to results in state discrimination. So um, I'll just explain this um, type of measurement first. So if you have an ensemble of states by probability, given the PI and uh, the states are given by rho i, all adding up to the state rho, then this expression here for mi is what's called a square root measurement, or it's also called a pretty good measurement. Um, and yeah, it's defined in terms of the, the negative square root of rho. So it has to be uh, a full rank rho to be able to do this. And this uh, type of measurement is known in state discrimination 
um, circles because for many cases, for many types of ensembles, this is the optimal measurement for discriminating between the states. And in many other types of ensembles, it is known to be pretty good at discriminating um, the different states in it. And uh, this is especially true, I think, for when the ensembles are close. To, it's not exactly in orthogonal states, but they're close to being orthogonal. Um, so these are known pre-existing type of uh, measurement. What we find then, um, if Alice chooses the measurement that we know to be optimal, we find that in the steering picture, so we're thinking of Al Eve measuring first and Alice receiving an ensemble, then the measurement that she's um, that she's doing has that form of a pretty good measurement. So she's doing yeah the square root measurement. And then if we reverse it, uh, if we consider Alice is measuring first and Eve is the one discriminating the states, we can also show that Eve is performing uh, this pretty good measurement. So this is a bit of a, an unexpected uh, outcome, especially given that in the case where Eve is steering, um, Alice isn't even trying to discriminate between her states. She's just trying to produce randomness. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an interesting connection that we want to explore a bit further. And this is just the more technical details of the results for the von Neumann entropy, but this is actually quite quick and straightforward because um, there existed this result, this um, this expression of the von Neumann entropy in terms of uh, rho and in terms of the post-measurement state that Alice has. So I've called this rho after, uh, all in terms of the von Neumann entropy in general. And so this is the expression for uh, rho after because Alice performs this uh, rank one projected measurement. And so to maximize this, all we have to do is consider oh, what's the best measurement to give us the best row after that this would be the largest. And so one of the features of one of entropy is that it's reaches its maximum value it is log two of D. It reaches this if and only if um, the state itself is the maximally mixed state in dimension D. Um, so we find then uh, very straightforwardly what the what bound for the conditional von Neumann entropy is, and we find the condition that it's only reached if Alice's measurement leaves her state maximally mixed and gives herself a uniform distribution uh, in her randomness. And so these uh, two, um, two conditions that I described for the H-min and for the H, um, they look quite similar. And in some cases, as I mentioned, the, the case where uh, the measurement is unbiased to row, in some cases you satisfy both conditions simultaneously. But actually these conditions are not equivalent in general uh, and they don't actually have to be unbiased to, this, to, the, to the basis of the state either. Um, so this is proven more easily by, by way of an example here. And so I've considered this cutred state row and di diagonal in the computational basis. And I consider this measurement basis given by the MIs. This is quite ugly to look at, but just um, if you can see that the these parameters A, B, and C uh, depend on these uh, three real numbers gamma, uh, and the rest of the parameters are, are, are adjusted so that such that it's a valid measurement. So it just relies on these three um, three real numbers, and so when you set these gammas equal to um, the square roots of the eigenvalues of rho. Uh, we find that we achieve um, the conditional min entropy, but we don't achieve the condition for the von Neumann entropy. And we can do the exact opposite then by choosing these gammas to be equal to the eigenvalues themselves. Uh, we achieve the condition for the maximal conditional von Neumann entropy, but not for the maximal uh, H min. And in both of these cases, this measurement is, is not an unbiased basis uh, to the state. Um, so this does leave room to ask, are there measurements that uh, are not unbiased in which where you can satisfy both conditions simultaneously. We don't know this yet. So this does suggest us to think that uh, if in any doubt you should use uh, mutually a basis that's unbiased to, to row because then you satisfy both of your conditions for randomness for free. Um, but having said this, there might be some cases where you don't want to make a, a measurement that's unbiased uh, to your basis. And this is an example here of a state um, that I've written in its diagonal basis. And the basis is these um, given by these vectors uh, psi. Um, and the special thing about this um, basis here is that well, it's an entangled basis, like many others, but we can show that there does not exist any separable basis that is unbiased to it. Uh, whereas for many, many entangled uh, bases, there are separable bases that are unbiased to it. And so what this means is, if I'm in the case where I don't want to make a global measurement uh, on my two qubit system, I just want to make local measurements, um, 
then I have to think more about which measurement to make because I can't make the unbiased measurement. So this could be the case where I'm in my lab and my friends in the other lab and we have one part of the state each um, and we can't come together and make the global measurement. Or it could be just the case where I have the entire state in my lab, but I will still want to make local measurements as it might be easier, more convenient for me instead of making tangled measurements. So in this case, um, I don't make um, an unbiased measurement. Um, so I'm, I'm left looking for are there any other measurements that um, that do uh, reach the maximum entropy for the Hmin or for the H? And numerically, we find that this is the case, although we were unable to find uh, an analytic uh, measurement to do this. And so it's an open question now for us if this is true for every every row, that's um, every bipartite row, uh, and if we can find uh, analytic uh, conditions for this. And so just to, to move on then, I went back to um, this picture that I showed you with, there was device independent, semi-device independent and trusted uh, regimes of randomness generation. And so everything that I've told you so far here belongs to the category of device dependent uh, random generation. And that's because even though we don't trust um, the decomposition of states that Alice receives uh, in the form of rho, uh, we do trust the characterization of rho. We trust that she knows what rho is and we trust that she knows what the measurements are. And so this differs then from the, the more device independent uh, regime then. And so this is fine as well if you're in a situation where you have reason to trust your measurements and, and your state, but maybe uh, if you want to be extremely careful or you have reason not to trust this, the device independent uh, approach might be better for you. And one other... Um, limitation that we have in our results so far is that we need um, the measurement that Alice performs to be exactly projective. So I gave a justification of why we restrict two projective measurements. So that was a uh, an operational um, reasons. But when you're actually applying a measurement in a lab, of course, uh, there'll always be some kind of noise. And as it is right now, um, in the results that we have, in the way we've done it, we need that uh, the measurement is exactly projective because we use that uh, form of a basis but if we introduce noise uh, it will become more complicated and there's a, a more uh, intuitive uh, reasons of why it's complicated to introduce noise here because uh, usually we think of classical noise in our measurements it's it's a benign thing but because we're in the adversarial scenario here uh, if there's any noise in the measurements we have to think well does actually does eavesdrop have access to this as well and if so how do we model all of this together and it'd be some a bit more complicated. So this is another uh, idea for future work of how to generalize these results to the case where we can have measurements that are approximately projective, but noisy, so they can be more implementable uh, in experiments. Uh, and just coming up to the end now, so I mentioned the device independent uh, regime. So I haven't worked on this personally, but I have worked on locality. So just, I wanted to give a bit of a taste of what this is and how, how much it differs from um, this kind of random generation and the device dependent case that I've explained to you. Um, and so the, the key ingredient here is non-locality. And so we'd have um, two parties, Alice and Bob. Uh, so it's not Eve because these two are actually working together trying to produce the randomness. Um, and they're in spatially separated labs and we have to give them inputs and outputs uh, so that they can perform a, a Bell inequality. And we'd say that they share a quantum state, a bipartite quantum state. And so if they can observe the maximum violation of Bell inequality, so I've given, for example, uh, one of the most famous ones is the CHSH inequality, uh, then that means they can verify what their state is. So if you reach the maximum bound for CHSH, um, then you know, in a device independent way, you know for certain that your state was this phi plus state, uh, one of the Bell states. And that's the whole principle of, of self testing. And so if you know that you share then um, this psi plus state, and individually, both Alice and Bob have a perfect random bit because that's when you trace out the other system, that's what they have locally. And because they trust each other, um, they know that eavesdropper doesn't have access to this. So they have a perfectly random bit with which uh, to produce their own randomness. And so this uh, has some advantages over the device dependent case because they didn't have to trust uh, any of their measurements and they didn't know what their state was in advance. They just self-tested to find what it was. But of course, it's a bit more difficult to carry out because it's a bell test, you need spatially separated. Um, it's a bit more work in this case. And also, Alice and Bob have to trust each other because if they didn't, uh, when they share uh, the state, 
if they measure it, uh, yeah, you, you know what the other person's state uh, is in this case. Um, so all of this to say, depending on the situation you're looking at for randomness generation, you can choose which regime you want to be in, depending on how much resources you have and how important that privacy aspect is for you. And so this is just uh, an overall summary here, some take home messages. Um, and so, yeah, the main point that I wanted to get across was that uh, in this regime where you have access to some limited quantum resources, they're not perfect, they're mixed, um, and you have no other resources, so you're restricted to carrying out projective measurements. This is uh, the upper limit of the amount of randomness that you can feasibly carry out um, these two expressions. And this is the case where you have a completely characterized state row, uh, but you don't trust the source from which you came. Uh, and in terms of your protocol and what you should do, um, if in doubt, you should do a measurement on bias to the diagonal basis of row because it'll satisfy everything that, everything that you want. Uh, and so okay, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions, I welcome them now. Thank you for your talk, Finula. It was very nice. Um, now we are open for questions. Uh, you can write them in the chat or maybe also like uh, say them out loud by writing the chat and then we can unmute you. So are there like any questions? Uh, I don't have one. Well, thanks for the talk. It was really nice. And But I think really your paper uh, you mentioned the term secret randomness that I think you haven't mentioned it in the talk. So what is it related to? Because in the theory it appears, right? Yeah, so actually this is just, there's different, uh, people use different terms for this. So secret and private are, are interchangeable. I think private is usually used for um, quite a key distribution settings, but secret covers the same thing. So we used intrinsic in the paper because we were focusing more on um, it's intrinsic to the state itself rather than the application you would do with it, but yeah, it's all equivalent. Okay, thanks. Uh, and that you mentioned the QKD as well, because these QKD protocols rely on the ability, right, to generate random numbers. Mm -hmm. So, can you please make some kind of comment on the possible relation between this kind of protocols you mentioned and the results you obtain? If there is a sort of relation, or if it's not, I'm not. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. Oh, what's that? I'm not an expert on this, so yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll actually say the same back. Uh, in terms of QKD, I haven't worked very much in this personally, so I have quite a a vague knowledge of, of where it can come in. But I'm familiar with the more simple protocols of uh, QKD, like the BB84. You'd have two um, parties that are spatially separated, and they want to create a key among themselves. And they would do this through um, sending states through a public channel. And then they would compare afterwards uh, what states they were for, for some sample and see if it was uh, tapped into by some eavesdropper. So I'm not an expert in this, but I will say that part of this protocol, uh, it always says, assume that, say it's Alice and Bob, have some source of randomness to come up with some uh, some bit string in advance, and then it's, it's kind of glossed over. So these protocols are very much built on them having some private randomness. Um, of some form. So if you wanted to be very strict in this case and think that the eavesdropper that's trying to hijack their key can also hijack um, the randomness that they're producing in the first place, then you might want to incorporate uh, these ideas into it and see what, what resources they would need to produce the randomness that they can really trust uh, this. Okay, thanks. And congrats on the paper, yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. I have a question uh, for the last slide. So uh, you presented a H-mean and like one moment mean entropy. So uh, yeah, so uh, so of course H-mean is like a more conservative uh, approach, but in a practical approach uh, from a scenario that they want to care about security, uh, but also the rate. So which one... Uh, is the best approach to to take and then second question is uh for doing it de device independent or a semi device independent so of course so if we want uh the best we need to have the optimal projective measurement but if you want to do it in a device independent is there any upper bound mm -hmm. information depending on the assumption we make or i mean is there any work on on this or not 
do you mind repeating the the last part? So an upper bound on on what what so of course device, this is independent the, bound you can move. Yeah, yeah. So this is the upper bound, of course, so the maximum we could get because you trust on the uh -huh. measurement. But is there any like continuation of this work that uh, you have any any uh, I don't know rates on so measurement device mm -hmm. or even full device independent case. Okay, I'll start with that part and say uh, I actually don't know uh, how this would compare to what you can produce if, if there exists even an upper bound of what you can produce in the device uh, independent case that's equivalent to this one. Um, cause I haven't worked very much in this, but I would imagine uh, as a guess that it would be lower because it'd be quite uh, a lot harder to to carry out and you, you need very specific measure. Like you need to have... Uh, uh, an entangled state, first of all, whereas we have no restriction on the kind of state that you would have. Um, but that is an interesting question of how, if we can find yeah equivalent bounds and compare the two separately, although it might be challenging because yeah, the assumptions are, are so different between them. Um, and trying to think now of your first question of which, um, which, which, which kind of randomness that you would choose for different settings. This is also going um, slightly beyond uh, my wheelhouse a bit and how how you would use these randomness. But of course, as you mentioned, the, the H-min is the most conservative. So if you're very, you want to be very careful, this is the one uh, that you would use. And uh, I guess we didn't work on the H-max, but again, if you wanted to be very unconservative, you could go for this one. Um, but yeah, it would it would depend on your context, but I haven't worked very directly on, on, on these applications myself. Yeah, thank you. Are there any more questions? I mean, there are no questions in the chat. So, well, uh, maybe I'll ask one myself. So recently, I've been hearing a lot about this quantum randomness, especially applications such as these quantum random number generators, and um, that some companies are interested in them and developing them for practical uses. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could comment something about this, or also which are in which context do we can we can really obtain an advantage of these quantum random numbers mm -hmm. with respect to the classical ones, which are almost only pseudo random. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the contexts where this has become more important recently is uh, in the context of Bell tests. Um. So. This has recently been kind of more famous, won the Nobel Prize, of course. And part of this, um, performing uh, a Bell test to demonstrate non locality uh, involves um, each spatially separated party would have inputs. And similar to the QKD assumption of having their own randomness, we always tend to assume that, yeah, these are random, these are uncorrelated. But if you really want a, a proper loophole free Bell test, you would need them to have uh, a really trusted form of. Uh, of randomness. So in the more recent uh, Bell tests that are carried out, it is a quantum, quantum random number generator that are used um, mm -hmm. that can be more certified for randomness to make sure there's no correlations built up between them that could uh, violate everything. So that's from the experimental side, a uh, uh, case where this is um, has been used and has been important. Uh, in the general case, I think it's still in the stage of development as far as I, I understand it, most quantum random number generators. So how it compares to, to the classical case at the minute, um, I'm not sure if, if there is such a clear comparison now compared to maybe in 10 years down the line because it's quite active uh, at the minute, but I'm sure more difficult to, to implement as well, especially when you add more and more assumptions or make it more device independent. So it's kind of a, a, a scale, I would say. Okay, sorry. thank you for your answer. So if there are are there more questions and if not, I think we can like finish the seminar. So okay, so thank you so much for for this interesting talk and discussions. Um I hope that you have enjoyed the big seminar as well. Yes, thank you very much for, for the opportunity and thank you for all the nice questions. They're they're very interesting too. Thank you very so, much.